Okay, we've got about 30 seconds before we're live. Yeah, I do mostly Zoom programs, so it's a it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The ones that the presentations I give for other organizations usually are Zoom as well. Uh, yeah. But the YouTube the YouTube format has really worked well for us. I'll have to pass that along. I, I've got a, uh, uh, a Zoom license that I use, and um, so that's convenient too. Yeah. How much? Oh, okay, is the... and we are live now. Just so okay. you're aware. All right, so um, hello to everyone that is watching already. We are going to wait until right at seven o'clock and then we'll start up with our program. But thank you for uh, being here with us tonight. Great, so we are right about seven o'clock now. Um, so thank you again to everyone who is watching this program tonight. My name is Caroline Hughes. I'm a biologist at the Loon Preservation Committee. Um, and before we jump into our program, I just wanna talk a little bit about LPC and uh, what we do and why we have these talks. So the Loon Preservation Committee is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1975 in response to a dramatic and noticeable decline in New Hampshire's common loon population. Um, and sort of the founding principle behind LPC was that if human actions had contributed to that decline and it, it was really likely that they had, then human actions, if they were focused and thoughtful could also help to reverse that decline and bring our loons back. And so since 1975, that's what we've been working to do. And we have sort of a four pronged approach to that. Um, so we do population monitoring here in the state of New Hampshire. We do management in the form of nest rafts and signs and water level management, communicating with dam operators um, and, and many other uh, things that, that work their way into that management category. We do research into some of the problems that are affecting our loon population. Um, and then we also do education and outreach. Um, and we're trying to educate people about loons specifically, but also about the larger natural world. Um, and so that is really where tonight's talk falls. We have Dave Gavatsky with us, who is going to be speaking about the White Mountains of New Hampshire and the wildlife that lives there. Uh, so Dave, we're so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for presenting for us. Um, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I'm going to share the screen. There we go. Does that look okay? All right. Well, thank you everyone for uh, uh, coming tonight for the program on wildlife for the White Mountains. A um, little bit about my background. I am a member of the board of directors of the Loon Preservation Committee. Um, and I've been a volunteer with them for a long, long time. And so I appreciate any support that you can give LPC uh, in, in the endeavors that we have. Okay, here we go. So welcome to the White Mountain National Forest. Um, I worked for 33 years for the Forest Service. Uh, the last part of my career was, was here in the White Mountains and that's gonna be the focus. Um, I won't be talking about Southern New Hampshire or the Monadnock region. I'll be primarily focusing on this region that we call the, the White Mountains of, of New Hampshire. And I wanted to 
to talk a little bit about, maybe this talk isn't that traditional, um, but because we traditionally think of wildlife as undomesticated animal species that live independently of humans and in natural or wild conditions. But today we usually think of, um, you know, well, mammals, birds, and fish, but now we include insects and reptiles and amphibians and native flora and, and wildlife. And we have lots of really different habitat, really wonderful habitat. This is a picture of Snyder Brook in Randolph. It's in an old growth forest and it provides clean, clear, cold water for um, a brook trout population. And we have remote mountain ponds, some of them you know, over 3,000 feet in elevation. This one's at Shoal Pond in the um, Pemichuasset Wilderness. Uh, it's a five mile walk in any way you do it, the shortest way, uh, a great place to see a variety of wildlife. And we have Northern Hardwood Forest. This particular one is a old growth Northern Hardwood Forest uh, near Franconia Notch. We have spruce fir forest. This is uh, Crawford Notch from Mount Nancy. Um, and there's a 1,500 acre old growth spruce fir forest uh, in that region. And we of course have our, one of our favorite things, you know, you might say it's the crown jewel of New England. It's the Alpine habitat. Uh, most of these pictures, by the way, are mine. And I tried to include even several from today. Um, I wasn't up in the Alpine zone today, but um, I was working with the Youth Conservation Corps crew and I was able to get a few pictures um, in between the work that we were doing on trails. Uh, so you further break down some of the habitats into these things that are called natural communities. And here's a, an example of one. This is a Bigelow sedge community. It's a fairly rare type found at very, fairly high elevation above 5,000 feet in Mount Washington. And it's the home to uh, the American pipit. And, and a few other species of wildlife that are found there. So somewhat specialized, but somewhat unusual at the same time. And in the Alpine community, of course, we have, we have um, specific other communities that we break down into pretty much a dozen different natural communities. And here's one uh, that shows you the three uh, big Alpine plants that we have in the springtime, typically May and June, Diapensia, Alpine Azalea, uh, and Lapland Rose Bay. The, the white flowers, the cushion plants are the Diapensia. And today I was out um, uh, with crew, as I said, and I just happened to be uh, walking by a greater purple fringed orchid, uh, just a wonderful plant. Um, and they're out at this time of the year. It's, it's not extremely rare, but it's, it is certainly uncommon. And of course, uh, one of my favorite plants of all time, it's, it's the fireweed. And it, it's a pretty unusual plant. I think you can see some wildlife there. That's a bumblebee that's going to pollinate this. And, um, and that's very important. And, and these plants, an individual plant can produce 80,000 seeds per plant. And what I find really unusual is that it's, it starts to flower from the bottom up and works its way on up to the top. So on, on a single plant, you could have the silky seeds that kind of look like parachutes um, in another couple of weeks. Um, this one has the seed pods that, that it, they're starting to ripen. And of course it has the flowers, but it still has the buds that have not flowered. So this is kind of a, a long duration flowering plant. You might see one of these two purple plants up, either the orchid or this uh, fireweed. But we, I suppose we want to talk about um, the wildlife that we traditionally uh, think of, the mammals that are out here. And we'll start with some of the uh, mega charismatic fauna that we have. And this is a Eastern bobcat. Um, uh, this was, um, in our yard. I, I live uh, with my wife in Jefferson, New Hampshire, and we see bobcats quite frequently. And, and because we do have bird feeders, we put our bird feeders up around the 1st of December, take them down the 1st of April, uh, where there's activity and lots of birds, and especially red squirrels, you're going to find bobcats. And, and we find that uh, the bobcat shows up um, 
and, and these pictures were taken through two window panes, so they're, they're not extremely sharp, but uh, you can kind of get an idea of what these bobcats look like. Uh, so we have a lot of bobcats. I know there was a proposal uh, several years ago to open up trophy hunting uh, of these cats. And fortunately, uh, in my opinion, the citizens of New Hampshire were able to uh, uh, defeat that proposal because I think it's better to have these wild animals uh, living their lives without being um, uh, used as pelts. So bobcats are uh, somewhat abundant throughout the state, not just in the White Mountains, but uh, all the way through um, uh, the state of New Hampshire. This one is uh, checking out a bird that's up at a, at a feeder. And it even climbed up in our apple tree to, to get a closer look at uh, uh, the birds and seeing what they were doing. We, we have Canada lynx in the White Mountains and Northern New Hampshire. And these pictures uh, are actually courtesy of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. They've been doing a long-term study of Canada lynx, also American Martin, but uh, here's one that was taken at a photo point. You can see the, uh, the scale in the background kind of gives you an idea of, of the height of the animal. And, th and these are amazing animals. They look at the size of the paws on this thing. And, um, and, and they're really kind of shaped a lot like a snowshoe hare, which is their primary prey. So they have really, really big paws, about the size of uh, my fist, um, much bigger than bobcats. And so they're able to float on snow quite a bit better than, than bobcats are. Kind of a grayish color. Um, we'll take a look at some of the comparisons in a little bit here. Um, but here's a family of Canada lynx. This was uh, further north in, in the north woods of New Hampshire. Um, population, we're, we're sure, not quite sure what it is, um, but wherever there's snowshoe hare, and particularly in these spruce fir forests, you do get a fair amount of snowshoe hare around, uh, there'll be Canada lynx up, up here. Uh, this one was uh, taken um, last year in the Zeeland Valley of, um, of New Hampshire uh, near Bretton Woods. Summer picture, kind of get an idea of the height. Um, and let's see what else we have. Okay, here's a comparison. Take a look at the uh, comparison between the uh, ear and cheek tufts. Uh, look at those tufts on the ear of the Canada lynx. I mean, they're just really quite long. They're very, very short on the bobcat. The bobcat also doesn't have these cheek tufts that you see here. It's, it's almost uh, like an interesting beard here. Uh, more of a grayish color, a subdued color, whereas the bobcats almost look like a traditional cat. One, one day I walked out the door and there was a bobcat, you know, about 20 feet away. At first I thought it was a just a just a house cat, but I could I could soon see that it was a bobcat. And they got these stripes along here. Um, both of them are just gorgeous animals, but uh, you should be able to tell the difference based on the ear tufts and the cheek tufts and and also the uh, the tail. Uh, here's some lynx tracks that are uh, on a down tree in Jefferson. Um, these are I think got these about. Uh, a dozen years ago or so. And I, I, I still keep that because it's the best picture which shows one of the typical hunting um, habits of Canada lynx or, or bobcat. They love to walk on top of logs because there's often a snowshoe hare, potentially a rough grouse uh, underneath these logs. And so they'll be able to, to jump on them. So if you got some down trees, um, you, what you might want to do is just to take a saw and cut those branches off on the top. And that creates a, a intriguing place for these cats to, to go hunting. And one of their primary uh, food items is the snowshoe hare. It's kind of like the uh, all purpose food for just about everything that is a carnivore in the North country, anything that can eat a, uh, snowshoe hare will, will do it, uh, including bears and um, you'll see some of the other animals. But this uh, animal is also called the varying hare because uh, it changes its color. It takes about 10 weeks to, to go from the brown color to this all white color, except for 
typically the tufts on the ears in this area that remain black, the eyes remain black. And, and this, this white uh, pelage, as they call it, the hairs, the hairs are actually hollow. So they're much warmer in the wintertime because they lack that pigment that they have in the summertime when they're, when they're brown. Here's, here's one that I took along the trail, um, um, let's see, last summer. Um, and you can see that it has kind of a white belly. This was in August. And so that process takes a little bit um, of time to, to change. Here's a picture I took uh, Saturday night. I was, I was in my barn, I was sharpening a chainsaw. I'd been working out on the, on the trails and I was playing you know, some, some older music. It was a, it was a song, uh, Let's Dance by the Hooters. I don't know if you're familiar with that rock band. And they get their name, they, they have a, a instrument called a melodica, which is a keyboard harmonica. And, and I swear it was like the Pied Piper. I was playing that in the background and this snowshoe hair came up to within five feet of me and just sat down and was watching me and listening to this, to this music. And, and so I, I turned off the music and he just took off after that. And I said, well, that was something. So I, I did get a picture with my phone um, of, of the uh, snowshoe hair. So I put the music back on and he, he came right back. Um, so I figured I, I could be the Pied Piper if I played music by the, um, by the Hooters. So here he is again, just checking me out. But um, uh, rabbits and, and, and hares actually are, they do enjoy music and uh, could be the beat or what. But uh, so they, I guess they have the same fine taste that I do in music. Although I did play a song by Led Zeppelin after that and he did take off. So I don't know, maybe it's just the just the type of music I was playing. So let's take a look here. The, the direction of um, travel here is actually quite interesting. And, and most people, if they're looking at snowshoe hair tracks, can recognize these, um, these, these big paw prints as the hind legs. And these are the front legs. And they're saying, well, how can this animal be going from left to right? I mean, you have a little bit of a hint here that it's it's dragging its uh, front feet in the snow, but it's a bounder. And uh, in this picture here, it's going in the opposite direction. But you can see these huge front um, uh, hind paws here of the snowshoe hare, and and those are the front paws. And so it it tends to put down the uh, hind paws first, and that's why you see it. Now, snowshoe hares they can jump. Um, they can jump six to 10 feet in the air if they want to. And so they're very good at evading predators. They build these, these avenues through thick brush. They pack it down so that they know the escape routes. Um, their main predator, uh, again, is, is bobcats and coyote and, and lynx. And hunters use um, beagles to basically track these animals and, and they tend to stay in their territory. So they kind of come around in a circle. And so that's the technique that uh, people that hunt uh, snowshoe hare use. Hunting season goes um, for, you know, about three months. Um, uh, not that easy, especially if you're off in the woods, but sometimes hunters like to just go along trails or on the edge of roads that aren't plowed and, and hunt from there. So another animal that turns white in the winter time, um, the short-tailed and the long-tailed weasel, uh, people call both of them ermine uh, in, in the winter time when they, they change color. The tip of the tail remains black. Uh, so that's one thing that you see. And they're, they're very light animals. Uh, I see them maybe once a week. They like the suet feeder that I have on, um, one of the trees and they'll go up and they'll work on the suet. They tend to stay by themselves. They don't, you know, the only time they get together with a, another animal is to mate. Um, and, and occasionally I will put, you know, a few pieces of suet in, in the woodshed, not enough to, to, to really make them full, but enough to let them go after the red squirrels that uh, we have around here in good numbers. Uh, the other animal is the short-tailed weasel. The um, long-tailed weasel, the range actually ends right on 
pretty much on the Canadian border, maybe a little bit into, into Canada. And, and you start getting these short-tailed weasels. This is a summer photograph of a um, short-tailed weasel. When it turns all white, that's when it becomes um, a, a uh, ermine. Um, these are, you know, trapped uh, for a long time. They're, the pelts are very, very warm, but uh, these animals, you know, three, four ounces, they're not much. So they're constantly out trying to feed and, and, uh, and gain, gain weight because their metabolism is so high. They love to eat mice and they'll actually uh, be able to take an animal down like a snowshoe hare that's maybe 15 times the weight of, uh, of that. I actually followed that I was on a road and just in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, the gravel road. And, and I saw this, this ermine chasing a snowshoe hare. And I'm, I'm telling a friend that I was with, we we're going uh, uh, snowshoeing. I said, I bet that snowshoe hare is gonna just take off in a burst of speed. But no, it was the long tailed weasel that jumped up on the back of the snowshoe hare and severed its spinal column in one bite and, and killed us, this uh, little, bunny. I don't think it's the Easter bunny, but um, maybe it's related to it. Um, and, and dragged it off. And it was dragging it off, off into the woods. And I stopped to take some pictures. You can see that white or black tip on the tail here. And, and the ermine came back, had the window open, taking pictures. And it got up in its hind, hind legs and it was just chattering away at me. And my friend told me to close the window because he had seen, you know, Monty Python, where the, um, the, the killer rabbits come up and get you in the juggler vein, cut your head off and all that. So anyways, I got some pictures and, uh, and I couldn't believe that that little animal dragged that snowshoe hair over the snowbank and uh, would have enough food there for, for many days. Uh, another uh, member of the mustelid family, um, a weasel family is, is the mink often found around um, ponds and, and streams. It's usually not, found too far from water. I've got a couple places where, or maybe one out of 10 times, there's a stream with a, with a, a, a trestle that I walk on and they, they seem to like that. And they don't realize that you're, you're uh, above them. And so you can sometimes get some pretty good pictures of them. So very good swimmers. They're actually um, one of the predators of, um, of, of loon eggs. And the next um, size up, river otter. Um, uh, a fair number of them, I often see them in families of four. They, they typically <clears throat> spend their winters in these uh, abandoned beaver lodges. I was checking out one beaver lodge. I knew it was active because I could see this frost column and, and I snowshoed over to it. And then about 50 feet away was an abandoned beaver lodge. And I heard all these noises. And, and so I got closer and it it, it was a family of otters that were in there. They eat a lot of fish, um, freshwater mussels, crayfish. They'll even find frogs um, in, in the wintertime in the, in the bottom in the mud. So you see them swimming around. They, they kind of, they're very, very playful. Uh, I've got lots of pictures of them that make these um, tracks that are sliding through the snow and they, They'll run for a little bit and on their smooth bellies, they'll just slide and glide and, and go into the streams. Uh, the beaver is one of our more common uh, mammals. And I mean, back in almost 100 years ago, their population was very, very low and people just didn't see that many beavers. And some of them were actually restored throughout the White Mountains of New Hampshire. But today there's beavers just about everywhere. Um, uh, and they are wonderful uh, engineers. Uh, in many ways, they're, they're like humans. They, they're really smart um, and they're clever. They're industrious. Uh, they know how to build dams. They know how to build canals, lodges, and uh, set up their, what they would, what we would term fences. They, they put up scent posts that mark their territories. Um, and, but they create these, these beautiful lodges in the fall that they're gonna be spending their winters on um, and they pack it with mud. And this is just recently packed with mud here last fall. And, and once that hardens, it's almost like cement. 
Uh, and so they have a little channel that they can come in and out of. Uh, and it's not a good idea on a pond like this to walk out there because a lot of times ice is very thin in these areas. So you can, um, you can potentially fall through. And I say that with experience having fallen through a couple of times with snowshoes on up to my waist. Never, never fun. But here's a scent mound. What they do is they just, you know, get the mud and, and vegetation and, and they'll, um, they have these, these glands that produce that castor oil. Very, very fragrant. If you, if you see a fresh mound, just, you know, pick it up and, and smell it. It's, it's really quite pungent. And this is what they leave behind. These are, this is beaver scat. And it's a, it's a fairly good size cube of uh, essentially compressed sawdust. And, and I had been um, dealing with beavers on a, on a trail situation where they had blocked the, um, the culvert and was flooding the trail and people couldn't go on it. So every day I would go out with a, um, a potato rake and open up the dam and use the force of the water to open up and you'd always find the scat here. So after I did it about 30 times, they ran out of vegetation and, uh, and moved on. Uh, elsewhere. But they do occasionally cause problems. Here's a power line not far from where we live. And it's it's flooding those poles, creating some weaknesses. And so that that gets to be a problem. And here's another situation. This is out at the Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge, where I, I do a lot of volunteer work. And you can see a, a recent dam that's here. And they've also dammed underneath this, this bridge, which is about 15 feet long. And so the water is now starting to go across the road and flooding and, and creating some, some real problems. So one alternative is to trap them out. And that's, that's what had been uh, done for a number of years, um, you know, 15 or, or 20 beavers a year, sometimes as many as 35 beavers were trapped out. Uh, by the state actually, because of the nuisance value. And, um, and finally, we were able to convince them that there's a better way of working with beavers and that's to, to try to deceive them uh, and to keep them from, from blocking. I, that's a channel that I had opened up. And so, so what we were able to do last year at, at Pondicherry and in some other places along the Presidential Range Recreation Trail, a rail trail, we put in um, four beaver deceivers uh, that uh, prevent the beavers from damming uh, culverts. And, and it, it basically, it's a, it's a complicated system, but it has a filter box out here about 30 feet from the culvert or the bridge. And so the water flows through this, the grating and it goes into an 18 inch PVC pipe. And then out through their dam, we cover it up on the dam and they just can't figure a way to, to block it. So what happens is, is we can maintain the water level by the depth of the outlet pipe that you have the water that remains there. The beavers have the habitat, the ducks and shorebirds have the habitat and we don't have to trap the beavers out. Um, so here's a, Here's the person, this is the person I've, I've worked with, Skip Lyle out of Springfield, Vermont. Um, I'm I guess I'm not supposed to endorse any products or anything, I guess maybe, but uh, uh, in the case I will, because he works for Beaver Deceivers International. And if you have a beaver problem, get a hold of Skip Lyle, L-I-S-L-E. And he's an expert, he's been doing it for over 30 years and he loves beavers, I love beavers. And uh, it's because they're, they're so important. So here he is installing um, one of the filter boxes here. Uh, here's Beaver Lodge in the wintertime. You can tell it's an active Beaver Lodge. There's frost crystals that come out over here. And these are coyote tracks. Coyotes love figuring out what's going on in here. And uh, I mean, you could actually stick your, your arm down here, but I wouldn't rec uh, recommend it because uh, beavers do have pretty sharp teeth. All right, uh, beavers create a lot of habitat for a lot of wildlife, including the moose. And uh, here's a cow and a calf uh, this spring. Uh, I took a picture. I was actually on a, on a power line and I was just uh, doing some survey work. And I happened to hear these animals crashing through the woods and it was a cow and a calf. And I said, well, I'll just wait over here and off to the side of the power line. and. Uh, and I was doing that. I got a picture of the of the calf again. And out 
behind me on the other side of the power line comes a, a bull. And I'm saying, oh, this is not a good place to be between you know a cow and a calf and a bull. And I'm, I'm maybe 200 feet away. Uh, but uh, eventually they left and I continued on my on my way. This is an interesting year over here. I don't know what happened. It was injured here. It's kind of uh, had, a, had a cut here. Um, this is a young bull. Um, and, and in the wintertime, uh, I'm sorry, in the summertime, they can actually grow up to a pound of uh, antler a day. Uh, so that's a lot. It's a lot for a, a male, a lot of calcium that goes in other nutrients that goes into the production of these um, tremendous racks. And they can be, you know, 60, 65 pounds. And these animals, uh, I mean, they're, they're big. Um, this is a fairly young moose. I can tell by the, um, although it does have a pretty good hump here, very strong muscles here. Uh, the, the rack is not particularly big. This is over by, again, over by Pondicherry. Um, and, and moose love to get into mud and, and they love to roll in it. Um, and in the springtime, you know, when the bugs are out, you know, that's what they're doing is they're trying to coat themselves to be a, have a little bit of uh, bug protection. Uh, and if there's no water around, they'll actually urinate in, in these things and create their own moose wall. Yeah. People ask, you know, where do you see moose along the roads here? I said, just look for the the skid marks on the highway there where people have jammed their brakes on. That's a pretty good hint that it's probably being used by, by moose. In the fall, um, the bulls uh, in September will come to these wallows and again, they'll, they'll urinate in there and they'll get it on what this thing called a dewlap over here. And they'll, they'll just roll in this. And apparently it's irresistible for the ladies. Um, so that's, that's during the, the mating season. So, Here's what they eat. They eat a lot of browse, 40 to 60 pounds of, of twigs and bark a day. Uh, not highly nutritious, but still uh, there's plenty of, plenty of food there. Um, and, and they need a lot of, uh, a lot of fiber in the, in the wintertime. And so I did this experiment here, you know, being a naturalist, I, I wanted to come up with what is the moose gross natural product? Not the national product. I know that economists do that, but naturalists do the natural product or the GMP. So I came up, my conclusion was that there was 1,417,500,000 nuggets per year. And so I don't like to have lots of numbers here, but I know some people will be looking at this on their own later uh, uh, and, and seeing it later. So here's my assumptions that according to Fish and Game Department, there's about 3,500 moose in New Hampshire. And there's about 100 moose nuggets is made per deposit. And I know this because I've been, when I come to a pile of moose scat, I count the pellets and, you know, sometimes there's less, sometimes there's more. And, and they make oh, about 15 deposits a day. Uh, so that gives 1,500 nuggets per moose day, and an average moose month is 45,000 nuggets. And most of us use the Gregorian calendar, which is 30 days. So, uh, but the moose only produce nuggets for about three quarters of the year. In the summertime, they eat a lot of aquatic vegetation, and so they're more like plops. So here's the answer, and I said 3,500 moose times 45,000 nuggets per moose month times nine months. And it gives you that, that figure there. And, and somewhere I've got the figure of, uh, because I had the average length of it. And if you put this one and a half billion moose nuggets, it would be uh, at least the California from, from here. So um, you may wanna check the math here. But speaking of moose scat or moose dung, there's actually, um, uh, some mushrooms, some fungus that uh, actually will be found on moose scat, even horse scat. I, I, I've seen a fair amount of this. And this came from um, Rick Vanderpoel from, from Sandwich, who's a, a, a friend. He, he gave me these photographs and I've got some others. Uh, uh, so anytime I see moose scat um, or horse uh, poop, you'll often see these mushrooms coming out. of, And they, these are called coprophiles. And so again, it's a fungus that lives on, on scat. 
But moose are on the decline in New Hampshire. And, and I remember back in the late 80s and, and 90s, I would, I would drive to work for the Forest Service and uh, you know, about a 30 minute drive. And I, I would often see five or six, sometimes seven moose a day. And I'm always very careful. I drove a lot slower at night than I did in the daytime. Um, but that number, you know, it's seen some ups and downs, but it, it's, it's really down quite low. And I, I think even 3,500 moose, which is an estimate, and Fish and Game has, has done a lot of research on this, but um, it's still an a estimate. The number continues to go down. And the reason is, is that uh, we've got a couple of things. One of them is the winter tick population. And you could get tens of thousands of ticks that, that uh, get on these moose. And the moose try to shed them by rubbing up against trees. And what happens is they, they get their, their fur coat, which is worn off. And so they, they, they lose blood, which weakens them. And then they don't have any protection from this, you know, the bitter cold in the winter time. Um, they, they have some other uh, problems. The brain worm is one. Uh, the, the deer, white-tailed deer carry that and, um, and it's spread. It's a complicated thing. They, aquatic vegetation, they get it. And, and so moose are dying from that. Uh, but one of the big factors is these lethal summertime temperatures, particularly at night, they don't really have any relief. So um, you know, these warmer temperatures when we're in the 80s and 90s, and it's almost lethal for, for moose. So I think we're gonna see a continuing decline of moose. And even when you go up to Pittsburgh, uh, sometimes it's pretty tough to, to find moose. I haven't seen a moose in, a couple of weeks now. Um, and you can also tell, you can see um, these are the road kills of, of moose, you know, by year. And you can kind of see this, this curve that has come up here. And pretty close to 300 moose a year were dying around uh, 1990s, probably around 275, 280. This, this year, 2005, there's a lot of moose that were killed. And you know, any moose being killed is pretty bad. So it's, it's somewhere around 80 moose um, in 2019. And moose, you know, you get a 600 pound moose um, and you hit it with your car because they're so long legged. A lot of that weight is going through the windshield. And so people can get seriously injured or, or killed, um, you know, in these moose collisions. So we try to encourage people just to drive slow at night and don't drive beyond your headlights, but um, too often, you know, and in this area here in particular, you know, you get this, these moose kills and the next day you, you know, have a dead moose out on the, on the roadside. So here's the problem. We call these um, ghost moose. And this is because of the winter tick infestation on the moose. And, and most of the, um, uh, the fur is actually gone from this moose. But this, I took this a couple of years ago in our backyard. Uh, I've got a big backyard. And, uh, and I think that animal probably could make it through. But um, for, the, for the young moose, it's, um, it's pretty tough for them to survive. Okay, let's uh, move on to black bear. And I took this picture last week. I was hiding behind some ferns. I, I just opened it. I saw them out there. Um, I actually have game cameras. I need to check on them. But um, I just opened the door and he just looked up at me and was uh, checking me out. So we have, we have a fair number of um, black bears. Um, this one's a bear, bear, a naked bear. I guess they all are other than Smokey Bear who has a, you know, the ranger's hat and, and jeans. They eat a lot of grass, and uh, if you're ever driving Franconia Notch in the, in the springtime when the bears are out, I, I, I often look up at the ski slopes on Cannon Mountain and the Peabody Slopes, and there's often a bear up there, and they're, they're eating grass. That's a good part of their food supply, but they're what are called omnivorous, and they, uh, they'll eat fish, they'll eat um, meat, they'll eat vegetables, you know, fruit, uh, you know, whatever they can get. And this one, uh, when it was raining a couple of weeks ago, was checking out our clothesline and wondering what was going on. So it's a, it's a wet, it's, it's a yearling uh, black bear. So just some, some recent photographs. Uh, black bears in the fall, uh, in the autumn, go through hyperphagia. It means that that's a fancy term. 
like what we do at Thanksgiving time, we eat as much food as we can. No, uh, the black bears, their hyperphagia means you're, you know, rapid increase in calories. They're, they're eating 25, 30,000 calories a day. And beech nuts that are found in American beech trees, and you can see some claw marks here, varying ages. There's actually a little guide to aging bear claw marks on beech trees, kind of a uh, limited uh, interest publication, but I've got a copy and, uh, and it's neat to see that. And you often see these claw marks when they're, when they're coming on down, uh, but that's what they like. They sit up in the trees and pull the branches, bite the branches and then eat the beech nuts. So here's the estimated population from uh, 1995 to 2019. And the goal is in the, in the red here and the orange where my cursor is here. And here's actually what we have somewhere around 6,000 moves. We're, we're down a little bit, but the, the goal with the department, you know, they have uh, professional uh, wildlife biologists and scientists uh, that have determined, you know, what is the, the, the best viable population for black bears and and people in the state of New Hampshire without causing, you know, a lot of problems. And so that tends to, you know, affect, uh, you know, how the hunting is done and, and the season and, and so forth. But, uh, but bears do pretty well, uh, but there are conflicts in uh, New Hampshire. Um, you know, some people, we can't have feeders up, up here and even a, uh, hummingbird feeders, sometimes that they get hit. But if, if the bear can smell uh, sunflower seeds, black oil sunflower seeds, it'll smell it from a long distance and it'll, it'll definitely take down your, your feeders. I, I've, I think I've only had one feeder and that was before April 1st. So it was a early um, out bear. Taking a look at some of the um, documented conflicts of, of bears, you know, looking at these things here and you probably are going to say, well, garbage and dumpsters is almost a third of the problems. And, and you know, can't we, we fix that? Um, well, on the national forest and at the um, state campgrounds, they use bear proof dumpsters so that you have to unlatch it and and so forth but you know not everyone has those and so you know once bears find a dumpster and get in there they're gonna they're gonna keep coming uh, bird feeding stations can be a real problem too it's a, it's a pretty high number but chickens and poultry uh, that's another big attractant um and let's see what else uh, these other figures here you know a little bit smaller but it's really we need to figure out a way to deal with garbage. And part of that is the way towns pick up garbage on their routes. And, and sometimes they, they want it out by five in the morning. And so what you do is you put the garbage out the night before, and then the bears come and spread the trash all around. So, uh, you know, towns need to work, work those things out. All right, moving on here. Here's uh, American Martin. It used to be called Pine Martin. Um, these are first reintroduced, they've been trapped out, fairly easy to, to trap, um, reintroduced by the Forest Service in 1972 uh, in the White Mountains, along with the um, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. It's a, a lovely animal. I, I, I see several a year, uh, typically on hikes, places like Shoal Pond in the Zealand Valley. That's a good place to see them. The Crawford Path, if you get out early, like before seven o'clock in the morning and walk that, you can often see it. Um, the uh, Willie Range, Mount Town Field and Willie, another good place. This is up at Mizpah Hut uh, in the wintertime and that's a uh, American Martin in the tree. And another one um, in the Pamajawasset Wilderness, uh, I had my dog with me and the Martin wasn't really concerned about me. It was going crazy over the dog and had never seen a a creature that looked that strange. And so it was just running around making all these noises. And uh, I love these little little cinnamon colored chest markings on them. They, they're all different on that. So that's probably how they tell each other apart. So I, I was hiking on the, um, the junction of the Crawford Path and the Mizpah Cutoff. And I came across this, this Martin, I, I saw it and it looked like it was choking. It Someone had thrown um, 
some gorp, which is good old fashioned raisins and peanuts. And the Martin was actually eating that. It was probably, the people were probably trying to feed the Canada Jays. And so I said, oh, geez, am I gonna have to do the Heimlich maneuver on this uh, Martin here? But it, it spit it out. I don't know if that was it, but uh, it spit something out. Uh, but the uh, Martins are, are pretty common. Uh, you'll see them up at the huts. Carter is another place to see them. Uh, here's, here's an actual trap uh, that the Fish and Game Department uses to take pictures of uh, Martin. I'll go through this. This is a courtesy of Jill Kilborn, who's one of the primary researchers of um, American Martin. And, and you see a pair of them that are here, one standing. Very, very cute animals here. And what they use is they use a uh, sardines and uh, up here, and they'll come up there and, and the sardines are protected from the rain and everything like that. So that's, that's essentially how they're able to come up these post population estimates and uh, population's pretty healthy uh, right now. Uh, next animal up in size is the uh, fisher, uh, the name of our New Hampshire baseball team in Manchester, uh, sometimes called fisher cats. They're not a cat, they're in the weasel family. And I don't, I assume they eat fish, but I, I've only really seen them uh, eating things like snowshoe hair and, and rodents and, and that. So they're more terrestrial. Uh, you'll find them in your backyards occasionally. Uh, I, I see more marten than I actually do fisher, but fisher is one of the few animals along with the Canada lynx that'll actually attack a porcupine. And the way fishers do it, the porcupine will be up in a tree the fisher is a very, very good climber, and it will go up there and try to get at that soft underbelly, knock the porcupine out of the tree, and then it'll run around circles, eventually exhaust the thing, and it'll go for the, the weak spots. But uh, Martin love, uh, and fishers love squirrels. And here's a, our famous red squirrel, and, uh, and there's no shortage of, uh, of these squirrels, particularly on years when there's a good cone crop. Um, I, you know, I kind of like them in some ways, although too many is not good either. Um, and then one of my favorite animals is the northern flying squirrel. We have, we have both northern and the southern. There's probably more southern flying squirrels. The population of the northern flying squirrels is kind of declining. They're typically found more in conifer stands in, in the mountains, and, and um, they go all the way down into let's see, uh, the Carolinas and the Smokies, there's a small populations of a subspecies there, but um, they're, they're called flying squirrels, but they really can't fly this, the, the, their wings, which isn't really a wing, it's called a patagium. And they're, they're more aptly described as gliders and they can, they can glide, uh, you know, typically 50, 75 feet on a typical glide. But what's important about them is that they love to eat mushrooms and other kinds of uh, food. And, and so they'll deposit, you know, the spores and the seeds and other things like that uh, in, in, the, uh, in the surrounding area. And so that's how you get mushrooms and fungi and other plants coming back. They live in cavities and the numbers are actually higher than you might think. And you see those big eyes. And so that's because they are, uh, they are nocturnal. So one of my favorite animals, Eastern chipmunk, lots of them, they, uh, they tend to spend the winters underground in their food supply and, and, uh, and come out once it warms up. So lots of chipmunks uh, around. And of course, this guy, the woodchuck, you don't often see them in, in the actual forest. They're typically on uh, fields along the edges of forest or on, on roadsides where there's uh, some pretty good soil that they can dig their burrows. But they're important animals too. Lots of porcupines. You'll see uh, many of them that are killed. This one had almost blue eyes. Uh, so I was quite impressed with that. Um, porcupines do a fair amount of damage. And this is one is up in a, a tamarack tree or a, a larch tree. It's actually feeding on the bark. It'll do the same with maple trees and hemlock. And, uh, and I, I've seen areas where hundreds of trees have been um, killed because of the porcupines. And occasionally you'll even see an albino porcupine Albinos, about one out of a thousand, they seem to have a higher frequency of albinism than, um, 
uh, than many of the other mammals that we have. Or this one had pink feet and pink paws and, and, uh, and it was a classic albino. Uh, it wasn't too far from the house. A friend of mine came over and he said he saw a, a uh, what he thought was a panda bear in the tree. And I said, have you been drinking? And he said, I don't drink. And I said, all right, let's go. I'll grab my camera and a, and a headlamp. And sure enough, it was an albino porcupine. So, um, all right, fox, um, red fox, pretty common. Um, you'll see them more often at this time of the year because they're, they're carrying food items for their uh, young kids. Um, this one here is licking its chops. And again, you'll see them on, you know, snow banks like like this one here. And a friend of mine took, took this picture. This is a really nice picture of a gray fox. Gray fox have shorter legs. They're typically found more where people are found. They're, they're not good in, um, in deep snow. Characteristics here, you know, aside from this grayish color here, uh, so much different than the red fox. Uh, let me go back to that, as you, can, as you can see here. Red fox have those really bushy tails too. Um, the gray fox has this black stripe that runs the, the length of the tail. So that's pretty diagnostic and quite a bit of white on the underside here. And the gray fox actually, you know, people, judge, biologists jokingly say it's, it's the uh, link between cats and dogs because um, it, it, and it, it's not a cat, but uh, it, does, um, it does climb trees and particularly apple trees. It, it'll actually uh, be able to climb trees whereas the red fox uh, can't. Well, moving on here, um, I've got a few more slides. We'll get into things that are found in the White Mountains, like the mink frog. It, uh, if, you, if you can catch one uh, and you can you can smell it, it smells a, a lot like um, onions. So that's a good indicator. But generally, you can you can hear them. It sounds like two blocks of wood uh, clapping together. And we have a variety of uh, insects. And I, I Pam Hunt uh, gave me this photograph. And I think if I had to pick the um, iconic uh, dragonfly it would, for the White Mountains, it'd be the ringed emerald because they're found places like lakes of the clouds at 5,000 feet and pretty high elevation. And we do have some um, what are called alpine endemics. They really should be called Arctic endemics, uh, disjunct location here. We have the White Mountain Arctic, somewhat of a nondescript um, uh, subspecies. And then we have the White Mountain fritillary, and that's a you know, fairly uh, beautiful butterfly. But those are our two endemic butterflies. And we have a grasshopper that's called a, a wingless grasshopper called the Alpine Boonie grasshopper in the White Mountains. Um, pretty cool to see. You know, wings aren't very good, to, you know, to use in a 60 mile an hour wind in Mount Washington. Uh, taking a look at a few of the birds that are found in the Alpine habitat, we've got the American pipit. Um, again, this is a disjunct location at Mount Washington and uh, New Hampshire Audubon has done quite a bit of work, Chris Martin in particular. Uh, we, we go up every year and try to do a count of the American pipits. Uh, there's a population here, there's a population on Katahdin in Maine and a population in the Shikshak Mountains in the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec. And then they're in the Arctic. It's, it, it's not a rare species, but it's unusual in that this is a disjunct or a population far removed from any other one. But the habitat in, the, you know, in that uh, Bigelow Sedge community is ideal, just like you know, what you might have in the Arctic. Uh, Garth McElroy took this beautiful picture of a Bicknell's thrush. This is somewhat of an endemic species in the northern uh, Appalachians that we have, and good numbers here in the, in the White Mountains. And of course, the black pole warbler, which is uh, a very high-pitched call, uh, probably the most common warbler above 3,000 feet in elevation um, to see. Uh, boreal chickadee. Um, uh, black, I mean, we, some people call it a brown cap chickadee. Uh, you go up the Caps Ridge Trail, generally you can get a few of them. Uh, go in the shoal pond, there's, there's a number of them. And any, anytime you're above 3,000 feet, there's a good chance you're going to come across these, um, these chickadees. We have, we have the black-backed woodpecker, which is, um, again, it's a, it's a dweller of spruce forest. Uh, this is a male. It has a, uh, a yellow cap on its head. Um, these, these have three toes. There's a three-toed woodpecker and the black-backed woodpecker. So these are um, 
a tri what are called tridactyl woodpeckers. And a lot of birds have, of course, um, um, not, did I say three legs? Uh, well, I guess you could say the tail is the third leg of the stool here. Toes, let's go with <laughs> three toes. And um, you know, a lot of them have four toes. None of them have four legs. All right, <laughs> we'll get that straight. <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite birds, and, and I took this picture on um, Mount Clinton on the, on the Crawford Pass uh, on, the, on the presidential range. So it's a Canada jay, and it's, it's a really friendly bird, but it's, it's primarily found in the White Mountains. Occasionally, they'll go further south in the White Mountains in some winters, um, but it's a cash hoarder. It, it will cash food, and some people call them camp robbers and that, and uh, you know, it's just the way it, it gathers its food. It, it loves to do it. I mean, people feed them by hand peanuts and they love that. And they'll roll the item around in their mouth and the saliva will harden kind of like a varnish and they'll be able to eat it later. So um, pretty cool animal. And the spruce grouse. Um, you generally will not find spruce grouse south of the White Mountains. This is a, this is a male um, up at um, around Mizpah Hut. And this black spruce stand. So if you know how to tell your trees and you can tell a black spruce, good chance you're going to find a lot of these boreal uh, species in the mountains. So my time is uh, pretty much up here. So um, I, I thank you very much for um, attending. And, uh, and that is my program. I'd be happy to try to answer a program, a question or two. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. That was really, really uh, interesting. You covered a lot of material um, and I'm echoing some of the comments in the chat that the photos you used were incredible. Um, so yeah, really, really amazing photos that you have in that presentation. Thank you. Um, there are some comments that are uh, in admiration of your Moose GNP calculations. <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty funny slide that you had there. Thank um, you. And so some questions. Um, number one is, so you've covered a lot of mammal species in this talk. Are a lot of those species on the same um, annual cycle in terms of when they're reproducing or are they sort of all over the map? And do you ever, uh, do you ever see them with their young? I do see, um, and I'm gonna stop the screen sharing here. Uh, um, I, you know, I do see, um, you know, moose calves and and um, and particularly bear. Um, it seems like every three days or so, I'll see one cub, two cub, or three cubs with with a mom. Um, I'm seeing lots of young snowshoe hare. Now, the snowshoe hare, for instance, they'll they'll um, have two or three broods uh, a year. They typically start in in May and they'll they'll go on through. So they're very very productive. Um, and I see a lot of young chipmunks, a lot of young red squirrels. Uh, flying squirrels, I don't see that often in the daytime. And, and uh, sometimes what I do is, I, well, a couple of times I've accidentally bumped up against a, a, a dead tree that has a hollow in it. And, and I'll get these, these gliders that have come out. One time I even had one hit me in the ear. It must have been irritated that I bumped into their home. But uh, sometimes if I want to get a picture, I'll just scratch with my my fingernails on the bark and you'll get, you get a head that peeks out of the uh, hole and you can get a pretty good shot. Um, but they, they breed at different times of the year. And of course, you know, the bears have a long gestation period um, and coyotes and, and so forth. Um, of course the birds, you know, Canada Jay even will, will start breeding in March. Uh, you know, fairly early. Some of our raptors are, are very early, uh, bald eagles. Uh, for instance, and, and I mean, those chicks are still, the eaglets are still in the nest and haven't really fledged. So um, it does vary um, in lots of different times of the year. So there's, there's always something to see, but it seems like the, the month of June is just so productive. May and June, there's lots of wildlife, lots of birds around. And, uh, and of course, I, I didn't talk about loons tonight because I know we have other speakers that do that, but uh, uh, you know, I'm always looking forward to seeing loon chicks and uh, seeing them ride on the backs of their parents. Great. So it sounds like, yeah, you have a lot to look at throughout the course of the entire year. 
You know, I always have a I always have a pair of binoculars. I actually have about four or five pairs of binoculars, one for every vehicle, and of course one here um, that I have. And I have a camera, typically, but you know, iPhone cameras or uh, Android cameras uh, are great for taking pictures, and sometimes you can you even enlarge them. So I do carry a camera with me and uh, of one type or another, and and that's always helpful too. Um, there's a question asking for advice on where to set up a trail cam uh, if they don't have an established game trail. Is there a particular you know type of habitat or, or spot that they could set up cameras to catch interesting wildlife? Um, well, that's a good question. It, it's it's often good um, to set it up on the edge of an opening where you have a pretty good range. Um, you, you wanna be careful where you don't have branches that are gonna be swinging up and down that triggers the, uh, the camera lens. Um, get a good one. I mean, you can pay $70 for a camera, but if you, if you double that price, $150 and get a really good camera, you're gonna get a lot better photographs in a lot longer range. Um, do it along streams. Streams seem to be the highways where, where animals go. Um, you know, you want to be uh, recognized that, you know, when you're shooting into the sun, it could be a little difficult. So um, uh, I have, a, we have a, a meadow that we put in for pollinators and, and <clears throat> we had to use an excavator. There's so many rocks, there's more rocks than soil. And so what we did was we created a uh, six foot high snake den with a lot of our rocks. And that has really attracted a lot of uh, animals to use that, that big pile of rocks. And now we have lots of flowers, lots of vegetation. And so um, I try to focus the camera on these areas that are really open, that they're gonna come through and, and get pictures of moose and, and deer. And, and at night, it's, it's usually raccoons and, and deer that are coming in. Cause I planted clover, clover, Ladino clover is very, very attractive to deer and they come and eat it. I, I planted it for the bumblebees, but uh, I'm happy to have all of the creatures uh, using that. Uh, there are some pretty good YouTube videos on how to set up uh, game cameras. Um, and, and I know there's a nature center over in Montpelier, Vermont called North Branch, and they actually had a one hour presentation on how to use uh, game cameras. It was a really good speaker when I, I saw it. So that's available. You can check out their um, North Branch Nature Center, look at their videos and look for uh, one on how to, how to set up game cameras. Um, and then we're getting close to eight. So this will be our last question. And it's a two-parter. I'm adding my own question onto the end of um, this, <laughs> this person's question. So the first question is, are New Hampshire's forests healthy enough to continue to support our wildlife diversity? And then my addition to that question is, um, is there any concern up in the White Mountains about beech bark disease? And is there any potential impact that that might have on bears or do they have enough other sources of food that it, it probably won't impact them? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the second one. The beech bark disease has been, has been around since I think the 1950s. And so you, you tend to get these waves that come through. Some of the trees tend to be a little bit more resistant. Um, uh, we don't have a shortage of, of beech by any means. And for the most part, it's not killing the trees other than on really dry sites. And what it seems to do is to create a bigger um, mast or beech nut crop because the trees are somewhat stressed. And, uh, and I, I know some people don't like uh, beech trees compared to you know, sugar maple or yellow birch and they discriminate against them. But you know, I think beech trees are really important for wildlife and not just, not just black bears, but there's lots of other creatures that eat those beech nuts. So I don't think we have a problem with, the, um, with that uh, beech scale nectaria complex that, that we have here. But the other question on the health of our trees in the forest, and we get some real problems. We have real problems in the Southern part of the state with the, um, uh, our native hemlock, uh, with the hemlock woolly adelgid. We've got a problem in the North country and in the White Mountains, but mostly in the North country with the balsam fir. We have the balsam woolly adelgid, our most common tree in Coas County, for instance, and probably even on the White Mountain because of their abundance at, at higher elevations. So the balsam woolly adelgid is killing a lot of our trees. So the trees are being stressed out. And so he, then we have the butternut tree, which has had a, a, 
a canker that's been killing off that population. We have a problem with the emerald ash borer, particularly in southern and central New Hampshire. It's, it's probably going to wipe out 90% of our ash trees. Um, and so, you know, you, you start adding all of these things up and, it, and a good part of it is because our planet is too warm and our habitat is getting to be too warm. And it takes time for, for trees and, and wildlife to adapt to that. So, you know, our, our focus should be on uh, trying to find ways to cool the planet down. And um, instead of really, um, you know, looking at arguing about other things. And so, we need to store more carbon in trees and let our trees get to be a lot bigger um, because we got to take the carbon out of the atmosphere. But um, cooling things down is going to be important. And I know there's the state has as people Kyle Lombard and others are, um, you know, really excellent uh, resources for insects and disease in our, our forests and and other. Uh, agencies are monitoring forest health, but uh, it's a problem, man. We've got a drought situation up here uh, and that potentially could lead to, um, uh, you know, some forest fires in, in uh, later this summer or fall if we don't get more rain, uh, but it's stressing the trees and, and trees, you know, they can, they're pretty tough. They can withstand things, but we need colder temperatures in the wintertime. And, and I'm a big fan of 30 below zero that uh, will cure most of what ails the forest. And uh, we just need that rest period for the trees. So I could go on for another hour on that, but uh, uh, hopefully that, that answered it. And, you know, feel free to, to write to me. I have a Gmail account, david.gavatsky at gmail.com. And if you have any questions that I haven't answered, I'll try to answer them. I'm, I'm working with a couple of Conservation Corps crews so during the day, so it may take a little bit of time to answer, but feel free to do that. And, and my last comment is please support the Loon Preservation Committee. It's a, uh, it's a great organization doing great work uh, since 1975. Thank you so much uh, for presenting tonight, Dave. That was a really informative and wonderful presentation and we really appreciate you being here. Um, and thanks to everyone who attended. Uh,